because this is our, this is kind of the way that our classes have always been set up. All of us in kind of our middle to later lives are in here, and then the younger ones are, are out there. And I think that this will speak to all of us. How, you know, how many of you are, well, that's the wrong way to, how many times in your life have you thought, I wish I could take what I knew now and just run it back to when I was in my 20s or 30s? Lessons that I learned in my 50s or 60s or even later, I wish I knew it in my, in my 20s and 30s. And that's kind of the way that I feel about the, the series that we're going through is discipleship. I, I mean, I've known the definition since I was a little kid, you know, since I was your kids and your grandkids age in the Bible class, I knew the, I knew the definition of it. I mean, any idiot can figure out what the definition of it is, but it just never really hit me until a long, long time, much later in my life that what you're, what you're really striving for is to actually have, and the religious world uses this, this way of describing it, what you're really looking for is a relationship in Jesus Christ. We started bringing this up in the last lesson in John chapter 15, because in John chapter 15, I mentioned that it's kind of tempting to think in John 15 that the only, the main application is the fact that we need to bear fruit, but we brought up last week that the main application is that we really need to what? In verse 4, let's put it in, James isn't wrong, let's just put it in the language that John 15 uses. So the, the real, the, the specific issue is not, the, the main issue is not that we bear fruit, the main issue in verse 4 as a disciple is that we what? Abide in Christ. Someone who abides in Christ, what will happen to them? Or what will they do? They will indeed bear much fruit. We discussed last week what, what bearing fruit would be like. We had actually, I've, I've already went past that, sir, but we looked at two ideas. First of all, we if we abide in Christ, we will look like Him. If we abide in Christ, we look like Him. And there was something I probably should have, I should have probably brought up in this, in the lesson, but I'd forgotten about it. When I do something, there is a good, 20 years ago, this became a massive marketing exploit, but when I think about doing this, that, or the other throughout my life, throughout my week, I probably could ask, what would Jesus do, you know? And if I can't see him doing the decisions that I'm making, and I don't mean the little mundane things in life, but I mean these big decisions that I make, if I can't see him doing those, then I probably shouldn't what? I probably shouldn't be doing them, should I? So me abiding in Jesus Christ, me being a disciple, means that I'm going to be like him. But of course, it also meant that we were going to, to bear fruit. Bear fruit, I, I did mention that I think sometimes... Bearing fruit goes a, a little bit, people's minds go a little bit too much to thinking that it only means that we'll go out and evangelize. There are, there, there are other fruits that we bear. Do you guys remember some of those fruits that we talked about? I need to, I need to mature. So my, my own spiritual maturity means that I'm what? I'm bearing fruit. So, so how, what would spiritual maturity look like? You know, as it, again, all of us are kind of middle-aged, you're older. So in your young, when you think about your younger years to what you are now, what has spiritual maturity looked like to you? So what, what does it look like to you? What, what does your great, your increasing spiritual maturity look like? Okay, so James mentioned that it means that you're knowing God better. That's a good one. What else can it mean? 
It means that you can be a better teacher. Sure. That one actually can be wrapped up in a couple of these that we'll talk about. What else? So you become a lot more insightful to other people. What else? Yeah, you're a better example. You know, I would think about when when you were young, and it's and it's easy. It's easy to see yourself in your in your kids. So, you know, I I appreciated what Grayson what Grayson said, but he's 23, and I can see myself in him, and the the impatience and the quickness to temper that probably every 20, early 20 year old has, what happens over the years? If you develop the way that you should, that mellows, that mellows. Now, sometimes we just write that off as a, well, they're just getting older. That's just what happens when you get older. But it might also be, that's what happens when you get what? When you get wiser and more mature. When you get wiser and more mature. You know, I was just like that. I was just like that. Something didn't go my way. I was just real impatient to get it to go my way. It's got to go my way. I, the, the getting frustrated and say, you know, that's, that's the same thing. We all have greater spiritual maturity means that I understand that I'm going to get that way as time goes on. That's a fruit that we bear. Uh, Karen had brought up teaching. I, I increase the talents that I have because I want to. And I, I learn how to get do more because that and you might think I'm I'm not I can't be that effective to a local congregation but one thing that that I've tried to bring up and I I hope that I've done it effectively and I'm sorry if I haven't but there's lots and lots of stuff that has to go on to make the congregation go lots and lots of things and and there's a lot of things to choose from for people that actually can make the congregation do better and grow and develop more and as I get older, as those talents increase, then I want to take on more of that responsibility. I, I am going to become more involved in the gospel as I get older, as I grow more. That's, that's part of bearing fruit. I'm going to, to be more, you know, I'm going to be more likely to praise God. This is actually where we stopped last time. And I've thought about this. I've had a whole week to, to think about praising God. As you abide in Christ and you you grow more maturely. How do you praise God better? How do you praise God better? Because I've thought about this for a week. Maybe that's helped me. I hope it has. How do you praise God better? Do what? Yes. And then how it comes out in action. So let me, we don't have unlimited time. So let me get to it. When I was a kid and my parents brought me, I learned how to praise God. First and foremost, probably by doing what? I learned how to either sing or I learned how to pray. And what'd you, what was the first thing you learned about praying as a kid? You had to what? You got to bow your head and close your eyes. Uh, pretty superficial, nevertheless. You, as you grow, you're getting older, you're learning how to sing. Maybe you're learning the parts. Your voice is developing for men and for ladies. You're learning the parts you need to sing. You're praying, you're, you're, yes, you bow your head, you close your eyes. You, you think about what's being prayed about. You, are, you, you like coming, you're excited to be here. Yes, all of that goes to praising God. But it goes beyond that. Because now I can start, as I get older, to kind of affect other people in my praise to God. So someone comes to you at work with a problem. And what can you tell them? I will pray for you. Someone can come and there'll be something that's good that happens to them. And what can you tell them? God is good for us. And God is good to us. So what am I learning to do as my life is developing? I'm learning to... Praise God. Just in thinking about how I can bear fruit, I wish that I could take all of these good ideas and go back 25 years. But, but we don't do that. I mean, we just learn the best that we can as we're going along. But we're learning how to be disciples and we're learning how to bear fruit. 
Now, this morning, we're going to just kind of extend it just a, a little bit by learning now how to, how to be pruned to bear more fruit. So, what do you do when you prune? You trim it. John chapter 15, verse 2. Look what Jesus said. John 15, verse 2. What did he declare there? He just he, Right after he said, I'm the true vine, my father's a vine dresser. Then what does he say? Yeah, he bears fruit. He prunes it that it might what? That it might bear more fruit. Uh, so when... We grow, when we grow here, so we don't have a lot of crepe myrtles in Tennessee, or at least I didn't grow up with crepe myrtles. Um, grew up, uh, got here, we put in crepe myrtles because that's what everyone had on the street. So what are you supposed to do to crepe myrtles in February? Well, Denise, let's not have the debate. Let's just talk about what 98% of the people do. What do you do? You cut them back. You cut... Let's say that the let's say that the the plant has six major shoots. So you you cut those off about knee to waist length or so. Over the course of the over the course of the spring and the summer, what happens to those six? They make about how many? About a hundred. They make about a hundred. I could take I could take pictures of mine, and I will show you that the six that you cut off by the time you reach now, September, October, they made about a hundred. You cut them back, and what happens to them? They what? They they prune out. They explode out with growth. Now, Denise, if I would have known that when I moved here, probably wouldn't have done it because I only have six times the amount of work every year now. <laughs> so. You, you cut, yeah, and I've got actually wild ones in the back that I never cut. So the point is, you cut stuff back so that it'll what? So that it'll prune out. Roses, would roses have been a safer thing to say? Every once in a while, Jenny, of course, when it's 105, Jenny sends me out to deadhead the rose bushes. You got to deadhead them. So you cut them all back so that they'll what? So that they'll bloom again. I get cut back, I get pruned back so that I can come out again. So, question is, how can God prune us? Psalm 119 verse 9, what does it say? Psalm 119 verse 9. And there, it's such good, it's good discussion, you get kind of carried away. I forget about the forward movement that class <laughs> needs to have. Psalm 119 verse 9, what does it say? Okay, now read 10 and 11. Oh, 119, I'm sorry. Psalm 119, verse 9. Okay, uh, read 10 and 11 as well. So how can God prune me? He can prune me through the Word. And, and how does He do that? I, you know, like I said, let's go back to kind of me seeing myself in grace. And I, was, I could be impatient and quick to anger. So how does the Word of God prune me? Right. It, it tells me to, you know, with me, it tells me to be more patient and to stop being what? Stop being so angry at stuff. That's how the Word of God prunes me. That's how it does all of us. You know, we, we learn the fact that this, that this book that we have, whether you hold it in a book or you've got it in electronic form, has a real viable necessity in your life. And it prunes you through that. Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 10 and 11. What do Hebrews 12, 10, and 11 say? Hebrews 12, 10, and 11. What does it say? Okay. 
there, it's, this is getting in, there's some territories in, not only in Scripture, but there's some territories just in the existence of all of us that are difficult to, to wade into. This is kind of one of them. And the reason why I have trepidation with it, and, and maybe someone else, you know, Jim might, might not have any trepidation at all, but the, but the one thing that I would have trepidation with is that things happen to me, and they can be bad things. And I know that those bad things are from what source? They're from, they're from the devil. The, the devil created the fact that this world can be affected by hurricanes, and, and people can lose their lives and they can have stuff that's destroyed. It's just all part of the, the way that the world changed when sin entered into it. Same could be said with the, with the forest fires. You know, a, a, if enough time goes by, there will probably be a lot of us whose homes will be threatened by forest fires. That's just the way of the world. But for Christians, Christians can providentially use difficult times and do what with them? They can learn from them, and they grow from them. They can be, they can be profited by them. Because the, the Lord, while Satan is using all of the difficult, terrible, horrible things to us to try to get us to what? To sin, God uses them. They exist. They're, I mean, there's nothing you can do other than the fact that just accept that they exist. The real question comes down to, what are you going to do with the terrible circumstances? God uses them so that we can actually what? Get, get better. Uh, so that I can become stronger in, in Him. You know, people come and they wake up on Sunday and they've got terrible pain. And maybe that pain's been there for years. But maybe it's a brand new pain. And they get up and that can be a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan that says what? Stay at home. But you can, and this is just an easy way to illustrate it because we're all sitting here, but you can use it as an opportunity to what? To, to overcome the physical and learn, just like 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 would say, that while my outer body is going to have a lot of problems, in fact, my outer body over time is going to diminish. It's, it's going to... It's going to Oh, the only word that's coming to mind is disintegrate. That's not a great word to choose. But what can happen to me internally? I can just get better and better. Just bad stuff exists on the face of the earth. And, and we have choices as to what can be done with those. God is always in the background writing to us, telling us, that when those bad things happen, if you'll use them to draw closer to me, then it's like chastening that you gave to your children so that they would what? Act better the next time. That's how I can, that's how I can grow. Thinking about another one. In, um, in James chapter 1 and 2 and 4, and also in Romans chapter 5 and verses 3 and 4, when we suffer... What do those sufferings allow us to do? Both James and Romans brings this up. They test our faith and they let us then get, get, grow with more patience, grow with more perseverance, and be closer to God. So just the fact of reading what Hebrews 12, 10, and 11 says shows that God has an interest in the decisions that we make. God has an interest in what you do with your life and, and what you do with all of these circumstances that come in your life, which are just like everyone else's circumstances. The only difference is the, the severity of them. But they're just like everyone else's life. And if you can use them to, to actually develop, to get closer to God, that's what God wants. He has an interest. That's why He tells us these bad things are going to happen. So make the right use of them. Make the right choice with them. That's how we grow. That's how we abide in Him. We become connected or we remain connected with the vine. Let's go to John 15. Back to 15 again. And looking in 4 and 5. John 15 back to 4 and 5. 
Because there he wrote, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you what? Abide in me. So the, and this is the, the big point. It is essential for a disciple to remain connected. It, it can't be on again, off again. It can't be on again, off again. And there's a lot of people who choose to live that way. What, and how... What, what, what do I mean by that? Choosing to kind of live on again, off again. Yeah. And so, think about Luke chapter 15. What, what parable did Jesus talk about in Luke chapter 15? With the man who had two sons. And what did one of those sons do? The younger son, what did he do? So he, he goes off. But what does he do? The point of the parable was he, he returned. Now, what was actually the point of the parable? Because the point of the parable gets set up kind of before he ever even starts talking. In Luke chapter 15 verse 1, the scribes and the Pharisees were really annoyed that Jesus did what? Would be around the... The, the sinners. So Jesus teaches the parable to tell them that He's actually concerned about who? The sinners and those who need to come back. And I guess maybe the real, real point of the parable is the scribes and the Pharisees should what? They should, be care, they should care and they should be concerned about them too. And they, and they weren't. In fact, all they would do is want to criticize Jesus for what he was trying to do with them. So the point of the parable is you've got someone who goes off, but then they, but then they come back. What's reality? Reality means, I mean, reality tells us we've all experienced it, and it's been a joyful occasion. Reality tells us that some people go away, and they do indeed come back. But most of them... Probably don't. Most of them probably don't. Can people who leave come back? They sure can. In fact, we desperately want them to. But when you, when you toy around with the on-again, off-again nature of discipleship, there is a very high degree of likelihood that you'll find yourself stopped in the off position. A disciple is someone who abides in Christ. And they abide in their life. And yes, if you could, if you could graphically lay it out through all of the years of your life in, in the graph that you might make, there'll be years where you, where you feel and, and you're acting as though you are really close to God. And then there'll be years where you might say what? I wasn't as close. You know, why, why may I not have been as close to God? Maybe because, I, maybe because that was a, a really big point in my life where I, I had to work a lot or something like that. Maybe it was a life, if you think about someone who was younger, maybe it was a point in my life when I, had to, when I was dating someone and they kind of pulled me away just a little bit. So there's, there's times where we could go kind of up and down, but the on-again, off-again nature of it, the, the real, real problem is... Once you're stuck in that off position, for a lot of people, they never what? They never go back. I've got to learn how to abide in Christ consistently through my life. That's, that's becoming a disciple. And that's what's so important about discipleship. So if I don't grow, if, if I don't abide in Him, then I don't produce fruit. And what happens when I don't produce fruit? We saw it at the beginning of the lesson. Jesus prunes and then does what with them? Casts them in the fire. Prunes and then casts them in the fire. And of course, what was Jesus talking about? Punishment in hell. Okay, prayers will be answered. Let's look in, Proverbs, in John chapter 15, verse 7. John chapter 15, verse 7. But start in verse 5 to 
kind of get our context. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. They gather them and throw them into the fire. They are burned. We just spoke about that. In seven, though, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. So, God will answer our prayers. Prayer is not what? So, someone tell me, when you think about the nature of a promise like John chapter 15, verse 7. What does that promise mean to you? What, what would you think about that, that promise in John 15, verse 7? And you've got to remember, of course, that you consider the context. Jesus was talking to who? His, his disciples, who, who actually are His apostles. Their work was going to necessitate Christ through the Holy Spirit being with them in a way that was probably beyond what we might what we might think of but nevertheless God still does promise to do what to to give an answer to our prayers so what does that promise mean to you what does that promise mean to you So everyone, that's right, and everyone's, well, I say, I mean, most everyone has, well, if you hadn't shopped on Amazon, you've shopped somewhere. So you can put stuff in a cart, that's where you pay for it, but you don't have to put it in a cart, you can put it in a place for later. And what is that place called? What is that place called? What's Amazon call it? A wish list, a wish list. For a lot of people, they think prayer is a wish list. What will God give to us? I mean, when we ask in prayer, and you, you've got John 15, verse 7, and maybe it's coincidence, but John also talks about prayer in 1 John 5, verse 14. And he seems to be a writer that's, that's especially interested in prayer, just like he was interested in the subject of love. And 1 John 5 verse 14, he had said, if we ask according to His will, He will what? He will answer. He will, he will give it to us. But I think the, a lot of what catches people up is that they see prayer as a, as a wish list. And so all of the things that we think that we need for life to function, for us to be grateful and happy and strong is not what? Is not what? All of the things that we think and we perceive that we need is, is not what? Is not what God thinks that we need. Is not what God thinks that we need. You know, what would be your, what would be your number one thing that you would ask for? I mean, everyone's going to be different. And there's a decent chance that the number one thing that you could ask for, God can give you the answer for it. But it might be that the answer that you receive for it is going to be very different than what you would expect. I think of Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. What was Paul praying for? Lord, take away this thorn in the flesh. And what answer did he get? First of all, did he get an answer? Yeah, he did. But the answer didn't what? It didn't, it wouldn't have made his wish list. It wouldn't have made my wish list. Because I prayed for it. You know. You guys have prayed for it. I'm thankful for that. I prayed for it. It's better. But it's not gone away. Never will go away. So what's the answer that I get? The same answer as Paul. My what? My grace is sufficient for you. In your weakness, you become strong. In your weakness, you become strong. When I abide in Christ and I learn to depend on prayer, I get answers. I do get answers. There may be not answers that I expect, 
Maybe not even answers that I wish for, but they are answers that can help me to be a better person, uh, to, to be a better Christian. And I need to keep that in mind because that's a part of discipleship. That's a part of this continual, constant abiding in Christ. Far beyond what's taking place in the walls of the building, my continuous, constant abiding in Christ. That's being a disciple. I wish I'd have learned that deeper and, hard, and, and more, more definitively back when I was a younger kid. But, you know, we just do the best we can as time goes on. Okay, thanks guys.